Support provided by Walters Papillon Thomas Cullens, LLC, specializing in business litigation and personal injury cases for over 40 years. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to be here in Baton Rouge. And um, I have to admit I was a little nervous coming as you were having this berry thing. And for somebody who lives in the desert where our annual rainfall is nine inches, I was considering seeing it all come down on one day. It was a little <laughs> scary. But I made it. I kept emailing Steve, say, is this really on? You guys are not going to be underwater. So I'm glad you're not underwater. It's a delight to be here. Thank you very much. I think I've seen every cancer program in the, in the city so far. But let me talk a little bit about what's going on from the AMA standpoint. So why do we do a lot of the stuff we do? It's because healthcare is so expensive that we are pricing ourselves out of the market. We currently spend $3.3 trillion a year, that's trillion with a T, on health care. And we are slated by 2026 to spend $5.5 trillion, more than any other industrialized nation. But our outcomes are not better. We rank 43rd in overall outcomes. Our life expectancy is going down. Our maternal mortality rates are going up. We are not getting what we deserve for the money that we spend. And we have to fix that because if we spend that 5.5 trillion in 2026, that's all the money there is. There's nothing left for roads or flood control or bridges that don't fall down or firefighters. We've got to come up with a way to spend this money more wisely so that we do a better job at taking care of the people who demand, depend on us. And this is hard on our patients. And sooner or later, I will remind you that we, sooner or later, we are all patients. And when you look at the fact that 40% of Americans have a difficult time paying their insurance premium or affording their deductible or being able to pay the co-pays on medications and other things, and a third of people have to choose between food and medicine in the richest country on the planet. And that should not be. And so we consider that we've got to do something about that. So the first question that comes up is, if you are running out of money, you look at what you're going to buy and you say, well, I'm going to buy this gadget for $1 or I could pay $2 for it. And which would you do? So this is one of the problems that we run into. In that the way that the healthcare system is funded, there's a payment system for hospitals, there's a payment system for physicians, that red line or the green line in the middle is the government's estimate of how much it costs us to deliver care. So they might underestimate a little bit because they use apartment rent as the indicator and non-farm labor, which my uh, nurses would be not happy to hear about. And the top line is what has been given to hospitals in raises every year. So they've had, since we started this about 2001, a 30% increase. Physician fee schedules have only been 6% up. We call this the site of service differential. It means that if I sold my practice tomorrow to the local hospital and saw the same patient in the same exam room, did exactly the same thing with the same personnel, the bill to Medicare would be double and the bill to commercial payers would be triple or more. It's just an aberration of the fee schedule system. So that's one of the ways that we can start saving some money. Stop paying double for everything. <coughs> figure out what it is you need to have in a hospital and move everything else out so that you can have a lower cost care. So I'm a cancer doctor, so a lot of my examples are going to be cancer. Sorry about that but it affects one in two men and one in three women, so everyone gets touched by cancer sooner or later. And one of the things we found is that if you look at the costs, the average person for the same service pays about $6,000 more. 
an estimate that if cancer clinics had not been acquired by hospitals in 2014, our bill for cancer services nationwide would have been $2 billion less. You start, add up a few of these billions, you start talking real money. So we're going to have to think about how can we do this because patients are going broke. Two-thirds of bankruptcies in this country are triggered by a health care event. <laughs> And two-thirds of those people have insurance. Think about that. How far are any one of us from one paycheck and a serious illness away from being in trouble? It's really something we have to address. So we're looking at the AMA at what needs to be done in a hospital rationally. That there are certain things that can only be done there. People will smash their cars into each other at 2 in the morning. You're going to always need hospitals. What could more efficiently be done elsewhere? because we've got to spend our health care dollars a lot more wisely if we're going to get what we deserve. So how does the AMA do all this? Let me just a little background. We're the largest medical organization. We convene 170 different specialties in the House of Delegates. We're a very democratic organization in that any physician who is an AMA member can introduce a resolution at the House of Delegates if they convince their state, and you have a strong delegation here from Louisiana State Medical Association. If you introduce a resolution and you can convince your peers, other physicians of this value, then that becomes the policy of the AMA. So it's a very grassroots, bottom-up organization, and then it's our job to enact that policy using our business tools, our advocacy, our research processes and all the other tools we have to work together on. So I look at, at the AMA as being a big machine to make changes in healthcare, to figure out what our patients need, what a public, the communities we serve need, and find a way to do a better job at delivering what is needed. So when you think about all of healthcare, it's overwhelming. There's so much that's wrong, right? We have to figure it out. So we put it in three big buckets we call strategic arcs. One is the fact that it's dysfunctional. You know, as I toured these cancer centers, they all have navigators. My theory is if you have a system that requires a navigator, what you really need is a different system. And so we need to look at some of the dysfunction in it, and I'll talk a bit more about that. We recognize that 90% of that $3.3 trillion we spend right now is spent on chronic disease, diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, cancer, other chronic illnesses. And so if we're going to improve the health of the country, we have to focus on that. So we started a big program looking at diabetes and pre-diabetes, where lifestyle changes can, can avoid that disease. And then, of course, we're focused on medical education. We have been since the Flexner Report in 1906. We just gave out a bunch of grants to medical schools to try to figure out how to, how to train doctors for the 21st century, because things are a little different than they were 100 years ago. So one of the things that we've done in terms of advocacy, and this was my statement last year, when we decided to file a lawsuit to protect the Title X funding, Title X is what funds Planned Parenthood, but it also funds for, um, reproductive health and primary care for women across the country. Four million women get their health care every year from Planned Parenthood. And what really encouraged us to file this lawsuit was that the government dictated what we could and could not and must say to patients. And William O. Douglas, a Supreme Court Justice, said in 1961 that any nation that tells its doctors what they can and cannot see to a patient is not free. And if a patient is going to trust me when I give them bad news about a cancer or when I tell them what's going on, they have to know that I will give them the whole story and the complete story, and that I will not do the bidding of government in censoring what I say or demanding that I say certain things. And so we filed suit and we won. And I'm very proud of us for doing that. We can, thank you. 
Another one of our big initiatives is this. That it's sort of a humbling slide for doctors because if you look at that little gray wedge up at the top, that's 10% of, of what we affect of how well people do this healthcare. The rest is who are your parents? That's hard to manage. What are your social environment? And what are your own risk factors? And so we call those the social determinants of health. And we really have to take a hard look at that because it makes so much of a difference. Do you know what the major predictor for your longevity is for how long you as an individual live? It's your zip code. It's not who your doctor is. So we looked at how you'd, you rank here. And we're looking at where the health outcomes are better or worse here in Louisiana. And I hate to tell you, but you rank 26th among the parishes for health outcomes. More adult obesity, more diabetes. This is not something that physicians manage. This is something that communities manage. And you are a community. So you have the ability to take on some of these issues. Physicians stand prepared to help. But really, this is lifestyle, this is access to food, and I just learned I'm sitting next to, to the person who runs your food bank, and I applaud your efforts for that. Because we need to make sure that people have healthy food to eat, they can exercise, though how you do that in this humidity, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> and um, we will continue to work on that one. <coughs> so my clicker has stopped working. Okay, they took it over. So can you ad advance it or give me something that clicks? It froze. It's the only thing frozen in this state, I think. <laughs> so it won't be frozen for long. <laughs> That's right. Hopefully it will thaw. Oh, we're back at the beginning. We'll see if we can fast forward to where I was here. Keep going. Or can I do it? I can do it now. Okay. So I mentioned chronic disease and that this is so one of the things that we really have to work about because if we are going to keep our people healthier and we intervene early in chronic disease, not only do we save a bunch of money, but we have a healthier workforce. And so we continue to put that high in our priorities. But one of our priorities we focused on through this last several years is ensuring access, coverage, health insurance, for all Americans. So one of the issues there is in the US, your ticket to get in the door is an insurance card. We want to make sure as many people have insurance as possible. Our House of Delegates tells us this is our most high, high priority, so we will continue to work on that. And that's why we also filed a suit. We didn't win this one in Texas versus Azar, which is to repeal what's left of the Affordable Care Act. So with the Affordable Care Act, they've already zeroed out the tax penalty. So in the Texas Attorney General uh, decided that he would take this to court and try to get rid of what's left of it. Now what does that mean? What would happen to us if we repealed what's left? It means if your kid is on your insurance policy because they're under 26, that isn't happening anymore. If you have ever had a serious illness and I'm a cancer doctor, remember, all my people have had a serious illness. They will have a pre-existing condition forever. And I don't want to go back to the bad old days when the patients I took care of could never get health insurance again for anything. It's just wrong. And if we want people to stay healthy, why would we not f have insurance companies cover for pre preventative care? mammograms and colonoscopies and other things that save lives. So we fight to do this. We would like to be able to keep some of these things because we think that they are good for the health of the American people. Then this is another issue that everyone is facing and that's drug pricing. Again, did I mention I'm a cancer doctor? And there are a lot of drugs that we use that are amazing but the average new drug coming out is about $100,000 a year. How can we do that as a nation? What can we possibly do for this? So we're trying to look at how we can, in a free economy, manage drug pricing. 
So we continue to start out with Truth and RX just to find out about this because if you ever want to see a murky business, it's the drug industry. We have no idea how the money weaves its way through that industry. It's a, and it's a carefully uh, guarded secret. And the immunotherapies, this is a scary new thing, CAR T cells. They may work really well to cure previously uncurable cancers for certain types of lymphoma and myeloma. But look at that price tag, a mill and a half. And we don't even know whether it's going to cure people or whether they're all going to relapse in a few years. So how are we going to afford that? Are we going to say this half the room doesn't get it, but this half can? Or are we going to figure out how to spend our money more wisely so that we can take care of people and figure out what a reasonable price for these therapies should be so that we are paying something that borders on being rational? The other part that you may not be aware of, but every physician in the room is, is that the insurance industry's attempt to control cost is called prior authorization often known as mother may I. So if you want to do any treatment, get any x-ray, get any therapy for a patient, then you have to call up the insurance company and beg. And the average primary care physician spends three work weeks a year getting other people paid, getting pharmaceutical companies paid because they authorized that drug, getting radiologists paid because they authorized that that imaging, get the hospital paid. That would make me completely crazy, but it happens to all of us. And what we see is that the majority of people get their care delayed because you're waiting on the insurance company. Now, what does that mean for people I take care of? Like, like you, New Mexico is a poor state. People travel 100 miles to come see a doctor. If I say, I could treat you today, but I can't, come back tomorrow, that means that family has to find transportation the next day. The daughter, it's usually the daughter, has to take time off work again the next day to be able, the kid has to be pulled out of school again because no one will be there to pick them up. And it really is a barrier to care. And we know that when a prescription is written, if there's a prior authorization delay at the pharmacy window, a third of people never pick up that prescription. <laughs> That's not good treatment for high blood pressure or diabetes. We have to fix this problem. So we continue to work with it to try to do a better job of getting some of the harassing barriers out of healthcare. Because this is expensive and detracts value of care. This is the wait times that people see. I've seen people have to wait two and three weeks to get their chemotherapy approved for oral chemotherapy by insurance companies. That is not a good use of our patient's time and of anything else. So we continue to work with this to try to make it so that if you don't ever disapprove it, why are you making me go through the hoops? If you have a project that works with this, let's have it be transparent and in this day and age, let's have it be electronic and immediate so we stop inconveniencing our patients and wasting physician and office staff time. Um, I want to mention one of the things that is going on that people are looking at to try to come up with various new ways to save money is how do we redesign care to do better? So Medicare, CMS is Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. They forgot one of the M's for one reason. But they just created this radiation oncology advanced payment model where basically they're going to cut radiation oncology payments about 4 to 5 percent. And they're going to require, it's going to be mandatory, and they're going to require that half of the country, and we don't know which half yet, will have this new program put in place where everyone will have to do shorter courses of radiation, bigger doses, shorter courses. We don't know whether that's appropriate yet or not. That hasn't been studied. But this is what the kind of things that are going on in the interest of trying to, to decrease costs. Um, the law that allows this to happen is called MACRA. Now, CMS and government in general loves their acronyms, right? So MACRA stands for the Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act. And because we didn't have enough acronyms, the government renamed it QPP for the Quality Payment Program. So we got acronyms. So what we're trying to do with that is to try to 
work with the government to say, and this administration has said, they want to decrease some of the burdens of documentation and paperwork. We did a study at the AMA with RAND Corporation. We found that for every hour that a doctor gets to spend face to face with a patient, they spend two hours with their back to the patient tapping on a computer. We don't like that any more than you do. So if this administration is serious about cutting down the paperwork, we'll take it. And we do want different payment models because there are a lot of services in our current model that we would like to be able to give to patients, but there's no fee for them. For example, I would love to be able to have a dietitian in my cancer center. Medicare only pays for dietitians for dietary consults for kidney disease and diabetes, not for cancer. So if we had a model that allowed me to do what I wanted to do for the patients and, and the reimbursement followed the plan, that would be very helpful. Um, they try to restructure these things by putting physicians at risk so, and putting hospital systems at risk. They think if you have skin in the game, if you have the risk of losing money, then you'll spend that money more wisely. There may be some truth to that, but it's not being shown. So they have all of these Medicare shared savings plans, the ACOs that you may have heard about, where the idea is that everybody organizes themselves together and delivers more efficient care and saves money. So what have they actually saved? 36 bucks a patient. That's half an office visit. That's not enough. And so as we look at that, the ones who are saving the money were actually the physician-driven ACOs, not the ones that were organized by hospitals, and also the people who were not taking downside risk where you could have to pay Medicare back. So one of the things I did was this come home model, which stands for Community Oncology Medical Home. And this was the $19.8 million that, that Medicare gave me when they figured out that I was saving a bunch of money per patient and by keeping people out of the hospital. And I started it out not to, to save money. That's what I wasn't trying to do. I was trying to keep my patients out of the hospital because I learned every time they were admitted, when they come out, their quality of life would be just a little bit less every single time. And so I wanted to have people to spend their time home with the people they loved in their own home, in their own bed, rather than a hospital. So we figured out how to do that. And then, lo and behold, that saved a bunch of money. This is what they estimated that we ended up saving people because we've cut our hospitalization rate for cancer patients to about 60% now of the national average. And we've been able to keep people out of the hospital and saving about 6,000 in the last six months of life. They took this and they turned it into a government-run program called the Oncology Care Model, where they took the good parts of what we do and the, the more aggressive management of side effects, the more access to same-day appointments. My practice does 15 to 20 same-day appointments every day so that people don't have to go to the emergency room and don't have to go to the hospital. And then they want to put risk on this. So we have some problems with that. Just real quickly, I had the ability to take the claims data of all the patients I had during my come home model, and I could compare what those patients actually cost versus what the target that Medicare sets up cost. And this is the slide that shows that. A good model would be a straight line, absolutely precise, 100% accurate. This, this correlation is 0.33. If I went to the local casino and I put my whole practice on red and I spun the wheel, that'd be 0.5. So this is a problem for us. So I'm now trying to work on, I figure they gave me money once, who knows, maybe they'll do it again. So I am working on another process now to build on what we did before to see if we can't use data science, artifi augmented artificial intelligence, to be able to predict accurately what it's going to cost a patient based on what their cancer's like, what they are like, what their social determinants of health are. We learned, for example, that women who have food insecurity have a 20% lower cure rate for breast cancer. That's a big difference. We have to address those, so I applaud everything you're doing on that. But we will put all of that into this project 
and see if we can't get CMS to allow the doctors across the country, doctors like me in different specialties, people who are interested in trying to do a better job for a lower amount of money, to see if we can't make a difference, to see if we can't figure it out, because the people who are down in the trenches, the people who are touching patients every day, we're the ones who actually know what does a patient need, how do we get it to them, and can we have a payment system that's rational to do that. So I selected just a few things the AMA is doing. There's a whole lot more. It would take days, and you're not giving me that. So I figure I'll stop here and see if you have questions. Thank you. So the question, if you didn't hear it, was couldn't we just get the government out of this and have a private market? Well, the government is about 50% of health care right now when you add up Medicare, Medicaid, the VA, the Indian Health Service. So getting them out would be a major extraction. I'm not sure the country would survive the surgery. But the governmental systems pay less. They have their own amount of bureaucracy. There's now a big push, you know, the Medicare for All push is out there to just expand the governmental system. I will tell you that in most places, unless you live in California, Texas, Florida, or New York, Medicare pays below the cost of doing business. It pays about 80% of my costs, not what I charge, not what I get paid, what it costs me to have a patient in an exam room for 15 minutes. So we are going to have to address that. Now the commercial payers are not entirely, are there, is, is Alabama, or is Blue Cross here? Yes. Well, too bad. Uh, <laughs> because the commercial payers, the, the for-profit insurance companies, are doing quite well in healthcare. And they are putting in all these prior authorization things and all these other hoops that we jump through. Now, one of the things I'm trying to do is actually, and the AMA does this as well, is to actually try to work with the payers to come up with a more rational way to prevent care. My local Blue Cross, I will admit, is my new best friend because they're paying me for all of the come home processes to keep people out of the hospital. So I like that. But I think that in this country, where we have a huge diversity of people and a huge diversity of interests and political persuasions and religious persuasions and everything else, that we will not find a one-size-fits-all for anybody. And if you, if you think about, well, AMA policy is to have individually owned and selected health insurance so that no one can cancel your policy if you get sick have it be subsidized by advanceable or refundable tax credits so that if you don't have any money it is cheaper for us as a country to actually give you an insurance card so that you go to your primary doctor and not the emergency department when you have a minor problem and have that be inversely related to income so that we have everybody would pay about six percent of their income on their health insurance and then we can get rid of a lot of the co-pays and deductibles that drive people crazy. So there is no perfect system, but we'd like to have the opportunity to try to work with people to help devise one. Yes, ma'am. How is the medical field with doctors and physicians addressing food issues, uh, processed foods, uh, non-organic food, GMOs, uh, uh, all of that stuff that is causing us problems with our health that are related directly to what we so there's a lot of interest in looking. What the question, if you didn't hear it, was what are we doing about foods and particularly processed foods, et cetera. So what the AMA is working on doing is to address the 93 million Americans who have prediabetes, which is a disease of diet and exercise or the lack thereof. And so before we get to people, you know, to say, yes, you have to buy organic when that costs sometimes double, we would like to have people get fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, be able to have a more balanced diet, be able to have pl safe places to exercise. 
When we look at the social determinants of health, that's a lot of what it is. It's food deserts. It's people who live in the inner cities and don't dare walk outside to get any exercise because of the gun violence in their neighborhoods. It's a myriad of problems. So what we're starting to do first, because you can't really address a problem and know if you're making any headway until you can measure it, what we're trying to do is to come up with a very respectful coding system for food deserts, no safe place to exercise, no transportation, no caregivers, no many other things, educational levels, and say if we can measure this, then maybe we can start to devise some programs that will start to address it. We have a long way to go because people underestimate the importance of diet and exercise tremendously. How are we on time? One question. Is the United States subsidizing the rest of the world's drug cost because ours is so high compared to Canada's or whoever you want to use as a reference point? The short answer is yes. <laughs> why is that? Uh, because our free market system has allowed that to occur. So in other countries, like in Great Britain, they have an entity called NICE, N-I-C-E, which looks at every drug and decides whether or not it provides additional value and what the price they will pay for it. Congress has decided in the United States that the largest insurance company in the world, which is Medicare, is not allowed to negotiate prices. And that's a problem. And so we'll continue to look at that. The other thing that we have in the US that we do not have elsewhere in the world are these entities called pharmacy benefit managers, which are middlemen who play the arbitrage between the manufacturer and the end user, the patient, and add about 42% to the cost of those drugs and provide no value. So they're my favorite target for this issue, is let's get rid of these middlemen Let's release them to industry and have them go find gainful employment somewhere else and bring our drug prices down. Thank you. Support provided by Walters, Papillon, Thomas Cullins, LLC, specializing in business litigation and personal injury cases for over 40 years.